calendar. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 6. We're looking at verses 1 through 19, title of our study and subject of our time together, the Sabbath and the Apostles. Luke 6, 1 through 19, the Sabbath and the Apostles. Luke 6 begins with two major conflicts between Jesus, his disciples, and the religious leaders of that day. These guys are hung up on a day of rest, a day to worship, a day to fellowship. And it's important to know this was all God's idea from the very beginning. But they kind of took it somewhere he never intended And we're going to be able to see that clearly. Now, the idea of a day of rest is first presented to us in Genesis 2-2, where as God had finished all the works of creation, it said he rested on the seventh day. Seventh, by the way, an adjective used in relationship to time. Seventh day, seventh week, seventh month, seventh year, we'll see some uh, you know, semblance of that in our time together today. Seventh day, though, can refer and does, in fact, ultimately refer to the Sabbath. It just wasn't called the Sabbath yet. It was the day God rested. So there's an example for us. He rested, though it's impossible to, to think God was actually worn out from his work. He said, let there be, and there was. He did get in the dirt for Adam, and and then he did a little surgery for Eve. But, But beyond that, I mean, this is God we're talking about. So his resting really means he ceased from his works because he had completed them. And what happens is, is he reveals in that example our need to rest from our work. I've noticed that, Well, most of the work Pam does and and a lot of the work I do, it's never finished. I know many of you can relate. It doesn't matter how much you do. Well, even if you don't work at a job, if you're one of those, those women that just stay home, listen, I know you never get any rest. There's not a day of rest that's hard to even get an hour of rest because you work seven days a week caring for the needs of others. And, and don't think for a minute that God's like, well, you're blowing it there, you know. Someone else should be taking them one day a week. No, listen, they're yours. You, you, you get the, the blessing of, of investing in them and caring for them, being an example to them. Well, anyway, he rested revealing our need and his desire that we'd find rest in him and live lives pleasing to him, full of worship, full of adoration, We read our first example where the disciples are going to be accused of harvesting on the Sabbath. The second will be Jesus healing on the Sabbath. So that will cover the first half of our study. And then we'll look in the latter portion at, at, well, those, those disciples who became apostles. And we'll just touch on them because we're going to be seeing a lot of many of them as we continue on. Chapter 6, verse 1, Luke's gospel. It happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields. And his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. Some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answered them saying, have you not even read this? What David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God and took and ate the showbread and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Mark adds in his account of this, uh, you know, conflict, that, that, that Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, then concludes just as Luke does, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Well, what's actually going on here? 
the disciples are taking part in, well, God's provision. And what he'd set up, it's called gleaning, very practical throughout that culture and for you know many in, in agricultural cultures today. Because what he did is he set up a system where if you were poor, if you were needy, if you didn't have sustenance, fuel, food, you could walk through someone's grain field and you could pluck what you needed to sustain yourself for that day. You couldn't harvest their crops and set up a little store to sell it down the street. That was never the intention. But this had a twofold effect. It provided for every needy person so no one need go hungry. The second thing, and it's as incidental, but it happens here, is the disciples would have been humbled a bit by this, especially Peter and Andrew and James and John. Why? They were hardworking fishermen. They had always provided for themselves and for others. But Jesus chose them to leave their nets, follow him, and become fishers of men. Now they're in the field like all the other poor people. And uh, whatever judgmental attitudes they might have had toward others, well, those are going to be dealt with somewhat here because they are seriously, um, you know, doing something God set up, something God approved, something God provided, but it would have been a humbling experience for them. Jesus' last two statements, when he asked the question, first of all, haven't you read what David did? This, this goes back to when David was anointed king, but Saul was still on the throne. And Saul's like, I ain't going, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm staying. And, and so he, he actually has David working for him for a while in the palace. He plays the harp for him because Saul's like distressed and has these spirits that attack him and he's tormented and David plays and he's all refreshed. But somehow in the midst of all that, he decides to try to throw spears at David. He knows that David's going to be the next king, but he's doing everything and anything he can to keep that from happening. It's a good thing, and it turns out that, that, that Saul's a lousy uh, spear thrower. He misses David every time, and ultimately David has to run and get into the wilderness. And so it's during that period where he's running from Saul and hiding with his friends that he comes and he's in need of bread. So he asks for bread. The, the show bread was the only bread that was there. That's the bread that was set aside for the priest who served in the tabernacle or served later in the temple. And so uh, he says, hey, we need bread. And the law said that was only for the priest to eat. And so he's, he's showing us a principle, and that is human need surpasses the law. It overcomes it. It's not like God just disregards his law. The law is there for a reason. God's law is anyway. And uh and so God's, God set it all up, and, and he said, here's how I want it. But when David was in need, the priest had no problem making sure that David and his guys had food. Here's an example be easier for us to relate to. Those of you who've um, been there for the birth of your child, there may be a few of you that, that uh, kind of got a late start. She said, hey, I think it's time. And you were like watching the game and you're like, well, tell me when you're sure. And pretty soon she's screaming, it's time, it's time. So you run to the car and then you go back in for the keys and you come back out and you're driving and you're hauling. Why? Because you don't want your child to be born in the back seat. And she's back there saying, hurry, hurry, hurry. You see the red lights behind you. You get pulled over. What transpires next? You show the officer, your wife, he gets in front of you, turns on the light and the siren and leads you faster than you were going to the hospital. Is that because he doesn't obey the laws? No, of course, the human need in the moment was more important than that law. The law is there to protect us. It's provided for us. We're not to be lawbreakers or lawless. But human need will always be the priority. And Jesus demonstrates that perfectly in the second illustration. But we're not yet there. Well, what happens, and I, at least I see this as perfectly fitting, that the first recorded conflict with Jesus, his disciples, and the religious leaders 
related to the Sabbath involves his disciples' need for food. Because the first time the word Sabbath actually appears in Scripture is in Exodus 16. It's six weeks after they came out of Egypt. God delivered them through those plagues with a mighty hand. Now they're in the wilderness. They're thirsty. He provides water. They're hungry. And Moses is kind of getting tired of it because, and, and this is very early on to be tired because he's going to be with them out there for 40 years. But they murmur and complain continuously during those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness of sin, aptly named, right? The wilderness of sin. And, and so they're, they're murmuring and complaining. The difference is murmuring is something you do under your breath. Complaining is something you do so that everyone can hear the complaint. The heart is the same in both cases. So anyway, um, they're... They're hungry, and God tells Moses, hey, tell them I'm going to give them meat to eat. Because they said, we missed the meat back in, in Egypt, and, and we missed the, 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 the bread that we sat and ate. Somehow they'd forgotten how miserable and tormented and, and horrible it was for them to live under Pharaoh in Egypt. All they could think about is what they used to eat there. It's, it's interesting how many times food is a major issue in scripture and so anyway at this point he says tell them i'm going to give them meat tonight and then in the morning i'm going to give them bread from heaven so so they eat quail that evening and the very next morning they get up and there's dew on the ground and when the dew melts away there's this 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 stuff well they said what is it and, and he said manna so they said what is it he said manna because manna means what is it and uh <laughs> I, I, it had to be fun for Moses. So, so God provides miraculously. He provides daily. And then as they're gathering, there are those who are always trying to beat the system. You know them. Some of you are them or have been them. But, but anyway, they're, they're like, you know what? I'm going to sleep in tomorrow and I'll just get it. You know, I know everyone's up and all that, but I'll just get it later in the day. Well, when they get up, it was gone because... It was under the dew. The dew would go. You'd see it. You could go gather it up. But then when the sun got higher, it melted away. And so th then they, they went hungry. Turns out, too, and it's important in the story, every man gathered exactly the amount he needed. If you had a family of four, there was enough for four. If you had a family of eight, there was enough for eight. Whatever the case would be, uh, there was just enough. No one had too little. No one had too much. But, but the guy who slept in, it didn't work out. And then there were people I thought, okay, the sleeping in didn't work, but I have another plan. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to gather twice as much today. Now, I don't know where they'd get it because he made sure there was enough for everybody perfectly. But maybe they were just over the fence a little and getting their neighbors. But, but either way, they tried to save it for the next day. And uh, turned out it, it, had, it, it had worms in it, and it stank. And this wasn't a place where they would actually still cook it. I've been to some of those places. They've offered it to me. And, and Pam's like, we'll offend them if we, if we don't eat it. I'll go, we'll offend them when I throw it up. And so uh, <laughs> not going to do it. So, so anyway, it didn't work. You, you couldn't work the system. You just had to work and get what God provided. Now, on the sixth day, there was twice as much as there'd been on the first through the fifth. And so they came to Moses and said, now what's up with this? What do we do with all the leftovers? It's going to stink and breed worms. And he says, no, this stuff's going to actually save. It's going to keep till tomorrow. And through tomorrow, God has provided you a day of rest, the seventh day. It's the Sabbath, first time they actually use the word. And, and so, so it's, it's, he's given you a Sabbath day of rest. He's given you twice as much so you can gather today and rest and worship and fellowship with your family and with the Lord tomorrow. It was a perfect system. He takes it beyond, though. I mentioned that the seventh or the Sabbath goes beyond days to weeks and months and years and such. And, and so he tells them, related to their fields and their vineyards. Every 
Seventh year, I want you to let the land lie follow. I don't want you to plow it. I don't want you to plant it. I don't want you harvesting anything. I just want it to rest every seven years. Well, they have a question. Well, how is that going to work out? How are we going to eat? And, uh, and, you know, they have the food from the sixth year to eat in the seventh, but how are we going to eat in the eighth? So what he did is in the sixth year, he gave them enough, both in their fields and in their vineyards, to cover three years. It covered that for the seventh. It covered that for the, excuse me, the sixth. It covered that for the seventh because they wouldn't plant that year. It covered that for the eighth because they wouldn't be, well, harvesting and, until the ninth year. So, so all they had to do was obey the Lord, and he provided miraculously, not just in the wilderness, even when they were in the land. In fact, their second captivity, the captivity not from in Egypt, but the captivity to the Babylonians, was tied to their disobedience in that very command. So God took it very seriously. They kind of blew it off. And in the end, they paid dearly for it. Well, God later codifies his will and his law. But the scribes who spent all their time in the word, they were scholars. They were always trying to help, saying, hey, well, we need to help people understand. God says not to work. Sounds pretty simple. Don't work on the Sabbath. Rest. That's God's part. Now, men start saying, well, what exactly constitutes work? They come up with 39 categories and all sorts of craziness. In the midst of all of that, they sought, they said, to clarify God's intentions. Instead, they obscured them. And they created so many rules and regulations and restrictions and, and whatnot to I like that word, whatnot. I never use it. I just thought of somebody who didn't. I'm like, I'm going to say that. So um, anyway, th 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 what he does is, is they made it burdensome and difficult, impossible to succeed in resting on the Sabbath because anything and everything you did would have constituted some form of work. Well, we read it in chapter 6, verse 1. It was the second Sabbath after the first. They go through the grain fields. They pluck the heads of grain. They ate them. They rubbed them in their hands. The Pharisees said, what you're doing is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. It had nothing to do with God's law. It had everything to do with men adding to the law of God something he said never to do. So the, the uh, religious leaders called them plucking the heads of grain, harvesting. And they considered them rubbing them in their hands so you could separate out the chaff and then just eat the wheat or whatever, the, the, the rye or, or the, you know, whatever grain it would have been. Um, they called that winnowing. And they actually had a couple others that they add to it, but two were enough for us today. It makes no sense what they're doing and what they're saying. So Jesus defends them by pointing out that God took care of David and, uh, and I'm, I'm going to make sure my disciples are taken care of. Well, the second issue has to do with healing on the Sabbath. And you'd think that, well, who could have a problem with that? The religious leaders weren't able to heal, but they had a problem that Jesus, who was able to heal, might heal someone on a day they decided no one should do any work. So it happens, verse 6, take a look. On another Sabbath also, he entered the synagogue and taught a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, rather he'd heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. Listen, Jesus comes into the synagogue, and this would be true anywhere and everywhere he went. If he came into your home and someone was hurting in the home, his eyes would go right to the most needy person. It's true in the synagogue. It's true in the temple courts. Wherever he was, he always focused on the most needy person. And I want to say today that should really comfort some hearts. Because some of you, no doubt, going through things you've never been before, 
You're, you're dealing with them the best you can. You know that you believe and you know you shouldn't feel the way you feel, but you feel the way you feel. And we know lots of you and many others that you know, you lost your homes in the fire and your assets in the fire, but you survived the fire. And there are a few people, because it's four months now, that are saying, hey, you just need to get over it. And I just want to say, if you're telling people that, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get over it. I'm not sure you'll ever get over it, nor am I sure you have to get over it. You just need to remember that he rescued you from the fires, that he's for you and with you today. And as we meet, his eye goes straight to you. He sees what no one can see. He sees your grief and your hurt and your, and your confusion and even your guilt because people make you feel guilty about feeling bad that you lost everything you'd worked for and saved your entire life. Here, here, here's the point. Jesus is here present. Wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst. And his eye goes straight to and his heart goes out toward every hurting person. We didn't all lose anything in the fire, but we're all going through or will someday go through things that are more than we can handle in those hours. You just have to remember, he's here, he's with me, he's for me. He's never gonna leave me, he's never gonna forsake me. He provided for me. He's still providing for each and every one of us. Well, they're watching Jesus. He's watching the man with the withered hand. I'm sure the rest in there are like looking at them and looking at Jesus and looking at the guy, and they're just waiting to see how this is going to play out. So what happens? He knew their thoughts. It says they are, they're hoping to find an accusation against them, but he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, arise and stand here, and he arose and stood and Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful, because they're all about the law, on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil or to save life or to destroy it? Now, they had no answer to that question. And if they did, they're not about to verbalize it. He's saying, is it lawful to do good or evil? Hey, everybody knows the answer to that question. Is it lawful? Of course, it should be lawful to save life and never to destroy it. Mark says he was grieved at their hardness of hearts. Matthew says, listen, you guys have a sheep. It falls in a pit on the Sabbath. You pull it out right then and there. And he goes, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So he's revealing the hardness of their hearts. He's exposing their hypocrisy because they're, they're, they're you know, these caretakers, these keepers of the law. And he's saying, listen, to do good, to save life, it's always a good day for that. To do evil, to destroy life, it's never a good day for that. I love that he tells the guy, hey, come here. He has him stand right in the middle, right where everyone can see. He's not like, hey, meet me outside after. You know, these guys are going to get a little weird and I can fix you up, but we should really do it later. No, he's, and I, I love that. He's, he's not going to back down from the challenge or leave this guy's need unmet because he knows these people are going to be accusing him and plotting against him. Verse 10 says, he looked around at them all, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. I love that too. And when Jesus commands the impossible, the impossible becomes possible. He didn't say, well, hey, that's cruel. You know I can't stretch out my hand. It's withered. He, he heard the word. He stretched out his hand. He was instantaneously and totally, miraculously healed. And so they, though, the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, and remember, this is very early on in his ministry. They were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Filled with rage. They should have been celebrating 
the, the miracle that, that now would enable this guy, Luke points out, it's his right hand. Why? He's a doctor. He's a detailed guy. And if you go to a doctor who's not detailed, you might want to look for another one. But, but he just, he, he, he sees that it's his right hand. Most people were right-handed. This is going to impact his ability to work and provide and all those things. He, was, he wasn't whole. Now he is whole. Listen, Matthew tells us when they're discussing with rage what to do about Jesus, Matthew says how they might destroy him. So they were already on the path of destruction. Verse 12 we, we, we see him go up to pass. Uh, it says, it came to pass in those days. He went up on the mountain to pray. And he continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. From there, he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. Now, there were a lot of followers, a lot of people who loved to listen to Jesus and wanted to become like Jesus. And that's the, the, the meaning of the word disciple. We're all to be disciples of Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus, you should be able to call yourself a disciple of Christ. You want to study him. You want to get to know him. You want to be transformed by him. You want to become like him. And if you're like, well, no, I just didn't want to go to hell. I just signed up for the heaven thing. And well, well here's the memo. He calls you to be a disciple. He wants to change you into the person he created you to be from the very beginning. So, so here's what happens. He's up on the mountain. He prays. He brings the disciples, and there's a large group, and he chooses from them 12 to become apostles. Now, an apostle is an ambassador, a representative. When we send ambassadors to other countries... They go with the full authority and power of the United States behind them. And when Jesus chose and sent apostles, the same thing was true. He's going to enable them to do what he's been showing them that he can do. And they're in training. You need to know, even though he's going to call them apostles, and even though he's going to empower and send them out soon, they're in training. They'll always be disciples. So we don't get to this, we go through this stage, then we get to this stage, and we're no longer that. We're always going to be his disciples. But, but to be sent out for him, it requires a little more from us. And he names the 12 that he chose to be apostles. We're going to walk through them rather quickly, and then we're going to worship together and and uh, go get lunch, lest we have the same kind of problem that they ran into uh, earlier on. So, um, but anyway, he, he chooses 12. Now, of the 12, he does, he pairs them. That makes it a little easier for me, at least. He's, he's got six pairs of 12 apostles. And he starts in verse 14, and this should make sense to you if you're a Bible reader or a Bible student. Simon whom he also named Peter and Andrew, his brother. Peter is always mentioned first. I'm sure he was happy about that. Peter's mentioned 158 times in Scripture, and we know quite a bit about him. He has revelations from heaven. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He also has a problem with with, well, just believing and trusting Jesus because often, far too often, Jesus will say something and he'll say, no way, Lord, that's never going to happen. And so he's someone who argues with Jesus. He's someone who has a vision from heaven of who Jesus really is. He's a spokesman for the group. He boasted that he was more faithful than the others. He denied his Lord three times. He preached the gospel on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 gave their life to the Lord and were baptized that day. And, and, and that's just, that, that's kind of how I'm going to do this. We're not going to go into all the details of his life. That's what the rest of the Gospels are about. These men and Jesus and all of the responses of the people around them. But, but see it. When we get next time into the, the Sermon on the Mount, or Luke's rendition of it, his, 
his uh, record of it. Jesus is never going to say to Peter, hey, by the way, I don't want you cutting off any ears for me. Not now, not ever. But he will say, love your enemies, do good to those who, who you know, hate you, pray for those who despise you and speak evil of you and such. So that's sort of built in. My suggestion here, and I'll bring it up again next week if I remember, is that the Sermon on the Mount is primarily for those disciples. Anyone who wanted to listen could listen and learn. We're doing that by reading them next time. And you don't have to wait. You should go read it later in the day. But my, my point is this. He's discipling them still. And, uh, and with James and John, and, and they're next. But first, let me talk to, to Andrew. Not talk to Andrew. Talk about Andrew. That would be weird to talk to Andrew. But uh, he has Peter and Andrew. Andrew is Peter's brother. And Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist. And so he and another disciple were with John when John said, Behold the Lamb of God. And we're told that, that immediately Peter, I mean, Andrew and, and, and uh, that disciple began to follow Jesus. And then as soon as that happened, he went and he found his own brother, Peter, Simon, and said, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And, and it says in verse 42 of John chapter 1, and he brought him to Jesus. Every time we find th th this man, Andrew mentioned in scripture, he's bringing someone to Jesus. He's the one who'll bring the little guy who's got the fish and the loaves to, to feed the hungry multitudes. He's the one, John tells us after Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come. Some Gentiles, some Greeks come wanting to see Jesus. They grab somebody and say, hey, this guy, these guys want to see Jesus. They bring him to Andrew who brings them to Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and said, my hour has come. And he goes on to say, unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He speaks to the reality of the cross because it was just ahead. Well, there are other examples, but we'll find them as we walk through the story of these two together. Next up, James and John. I already mentioned he said, didn't cut, you know, don't cut off any ears. James and John were fishermen, they were partners in the fishing, uh, you know, work with um, Peter and Andrew. So they are called in scripture, by the way, the sons of thunder. They're two that covet position. They'll actually at one point ask if they can sit at Jesus' right hand and left hand when he comes into his kingdom. Let me just say, they weren't really getting the long view there because he hasn't returned yet to establish the kingdom they were talking about on the earth, though I believe that's soon to happen. They're thinking it's going to happen then and there. So they often have this discussion about who will be the greatest, who will be preeminent, who will sit on the places of great notoriety and such. So these guys have some problems. They also have serious issues with Samaritans. In fact, they hate Samaritans. How do we know? Because when the Samaritans denied Jesus' passage through their territory, they were so upset, they went to Jesus and said, just give us the word. And what they meant is give us the word and the power. And we'll call fire down out of heaven and destroy them, just like Elijah did, the prophets of Baal. And Jesus looks at them and says, you don't know of what spirit you are. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. It will take a while. Ultimately, they'll get over it. But Jesus had to go another time through Samaria to meet a woman at a well. And, and then he tells the story of the good Samaritan. And in every time he brings up Samaritans, Jesus, that is, he's trying to break down that wall of, of prejudice and bigotry and hatred because these guys really thought not only were they better than the Samaritans, but they didn't see the Samaritans included in their, their work at all. If they could have it their way, the Samaritans would never hear the gospel and get saved. And, and, and so Jesus, when he's saying, love your enemies, pray for them and do good, I, I know he's looking right at James and John. 
I know he's looking right at Peter, and, and he would have been looking at some of us as well. Well, next up, Philip and Bartholomew. We don't know a lot about uh, Bartholomew, but we do know Philip led Bartholomew to the Lord, or at least brought him to the Lord. Uh, Bartholomew is more often called uh, Nathaniel in the scriptures. John 1.43 says that, that uh, the following day Jesus went to Galilee. He found Philip and said, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel, that's our Bartholomew, and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Now we know he's Jesus of Bethlehem, son of God, but, but, but at least they got the, the Moses and the prophets part right. They said, but, and they got the right guy. We found the right one. We found the Savior. We found the Messiah. Actually, he'd found them, and we're going to see that as we continue on. So Philip and Bartholomew, we know less about them, and it starts to be that way. But Matthew and Thomas, we know a great deal about. They're two that we have considerable press on. Um, Matthew, we saw him converted last time. His name was Levi, so he's Levi, and he's Matthew. A lot of these guys have more than one name. Often it's Jesus changing their name. Uh, Levi was a tax collector. He's the one who sat at the booth and observed all the things that were taking place. He's the one Jesus walked up to and called him to leave his trade and follow him. He did. He holds a great feast. All his friends who were tax collectors, by the way, came. And, uh, and they get to hear and sit with and fellowship with Jesus. So we, we have... Matthew, and then we have Thomas. Thomas is three things. He's a downer, he's a doubter, and I'll get to the third in a moment. Thomas is mentioned 12 times, Matthew only five times, surprisingly, in, in the New Testament. John eleven sixteen tells us when Jesus said, hey, it's time. I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be crucified but I'm going to rise again the third day that, that, that our doubter, I mean, well, what did I call him? A downer. Our downer, Thomas said, uh, well, we might as well go die with him there too. <laughs> and, and so I'm certain he sounded like Eeyore, but, but it, it's just, it's like, yeah, let's go die with them. That wasn't the plan. He was going to die for them and for us. They ultimately will give their lives for him, but not then and not even close. So the, the, the second thing, and more of us are familiar with this about him, is he's a doubter. He's called Doubting Thomas, and for good reason. When the disciples are hiding after the resurrection, Jesus appears behind locked doors, freaks them out. He says, peace be with you. He often does that. And, and then they tell, once he leaves, they tell Thomas, hey, you should have been there. Jesus showed up and we all saw him. And Thomas' response, unless I see in his hands, this is John 20, 25, for those of you who are jotting these things, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger in the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. It's amazing when you, when you see how these guys respond because this is after all the three and a half years of discipleship. This guy's like, I won't believe it unless I can see and handle it. After eight days, there, there again, Jesus shows up. Thomas is with them. Jesus comes and says, peace to you. He says to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. So he goes from a downer to a doubter to a believer and worshiper of Jesus because he says, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Last four, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon called the zealot. I want to say Matthew and Mark call Simon the Zealot a Canaanite. 
So he's the only one called such a thing. Is it significant? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but, but I do know that it's important that when he mentions the first, um, the, the first um, of the Judases, it's going to be very important. And it's possible that James was very happy that he was often identified uh, with his father. His father would have been happy about that because it separates him from anyone else. Judas, though, and you know this well, there are two Judases. There's Judas, the son of James, verse 16, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Uh, in our early years at Calvary, we had a couple guys named Jeff, and I don't know how it happened. It was a family thing. The church was little, so most people were in on it. But uh, they somehow ended up being called the good Jeff and the bad Jeff. So, so if Pam said, hey, Jeff's coming over to you know, help you with this project, I'm like, which one? And she'd be like, the good Jeff. And I'd be like, awesome, that's great. But, but nevertheless, you, you wanted to you know, make a distinction between the two. I had a personal experience along these lines, about a year old in the Lord and my little home fellowship, my dad, my sis, my brother, lots of my friends had come to the Lord. We're in our little home fellowship. And in the end of the teaching time, my dad starts to pray out loud. And he's like, Lord, just help my son get off the drugs and to stop drinking and to start working. And I'm like horrified. And, and I, could, I didn't open my eyes, but I could feel all other eyes were open and looking at me. And my buddy Leo, he starts to pray, yes, Lord, help Sam's brother Mitch get off the drugs and, and get off the drinking and start working. Listen, does it matter that you know which brother? Absolutely. And you would not want to just be called Judas knowing that the betrayer, the traitor, was also named Judas. So it's a small thing to us, but a big thing to them. He identifies them. We know more about Judas Iscariot than we want to know. We know he was the betrayer. And Jesus said, one of you will betray me, the rest of you will deny me. And, and got Peter in his whole thing. But, but, but Judas does come back and confess after selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver he said, I betrayed innocent blood. He, he knew Jesus wasn't guilty of anything. And, and then he tried to return the money, and they said, we're not taking that. That's blood money. We don't want it. And so he threw it on the floor of the temple. They used the, the 30 pieces to buy a potter's field where then they then buried the poor. And, and all of that was prophesied. And, and we get into those things when we get to the crucifixion and the resurrection and that part of the story, but, but Judas ends up going out and hanging himself, two accounts of his death. One says he hung himself, the other says he fell and his bowels gushed out, and, and it's an easy thing to see. He hangs himself as he falls, it's rocky terrain, you know, that whole gross situation and scene. So that brings us to the conclusion of this study, and, and well, in a moment, then we're going to worship after we give opportunity for any and all of you to just say, Lord, man, thank you so much for reminding me that you love me and that there's nothing I go through that you're unaware of and that your eyes are on me today and your heart's for me today. Jesus chose these 12. He discipled them. He sent them out to change the world one person at a time. It's the same plan. It's the same gospel. It's the same power. It's the same Lord. We, we read in the last two or three verses, he came down with them. He stood on a level place with the crowd of his disciples. A great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him, and I love that, and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Lord, we've gathered today to worship you and to hear from you. And it's our fervent prayer that you would connect with us individually and personally.
We know you're here. You say where two or three are gathered together in your name. There you are in the midst. But not everyone here knows or realizes or believes that. So, Lord, would you reveal yourself to them as only you can? Would you meet with and love on every hurting, tormented, broken heart today? Will you give them that hope that, that well, you've given to us in our time of suffering and, and need and trial? And Lord, will you take those who are confused and, and wounded and hurting and, and give them, grace them, with that peace that surpasses understanding, the peace that doesn't require an explanation for how he could let this happen or why I'm going through these things. You promise a peace. Will you give them that peace today? And finally, Lord, if there'd be any or many who've never said, Jesus, I hear it, I get it, you're God and you're the Savior and I'm a lost sinner in need of your salvation and your forgiveness. I confess my need, I confess you as Lord, and I ask you to save me from my sin. If that's you and you've never done it, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high so I can pray with you the very same prayer I prayed the day I surrendered my life to the one who gave his life for me. If you're not yet in Christ Jesus, you can give your life to him here and now, and I encourage you with all that's in me to take that step to pray that prayer, to surrender to him. Anyone this hour, anyone this service. Lord, we look for hands, but you're looking right at hearts. And I pray that not one person will leave here without knowing that you're for them and with them and that your plan's perfect, that your power unlimited, and your vision for who they can become, oh Lord, reveal it, and then have your way in every heart we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.